Um, before I do that, I want to point out that uh, one of the mysteries that I have uh, alluded to is the fact that the laws of nature are mathematical. And this is a famous problem that physicists like to talk about over coffee. Um, uh, if, you, if you're a Platonist, you can think of mathematics as a sort of infinite warehouse of wonderful mathematical objects and relationships. It's sort of out there. It's a resource available to Mother Nature who's come in and sort of plucked a few choice uh, samples out of this warehouse and used them for the laws of physics. Uh, and it's a complete mystery in the conventional way of looking at uh, uh, the laws of physics as to why this is so. Uh, you know, where, where does mathematics come from? Where do the laws of physics come from? But if we think of uh, uh, the laws of physics as, uh, and, and indeed of, of mathematics, as intrinsic to the universe, like the, the, the software on the great cosmic computer, if we think of it that way, then we have a possibility of explaining mathematics and physical law as part of a common package. They co-emerge. Uh, and um, I should say that this is not my idea, uh, that um, Paul Benioff, one of the founders of uh, the quantum theory of computation uh, has, uh, uh, was the first person to suggest this notion that mathematics and physics really, uh, rather than just assuming mathematics exists and then uh, plucking the laws of physics out of midair, one might hope that, that we explain the nature of mathematics and physical law uh, from a common source. Now, I've said that I'm going to give a couple of examples where it matters as to whether we think of the law as, laws as intrinsic to and software in the universe or platonic. Um, and there are two, uh, well, first of all, let me tell you why, may, why there should be a difference. Uh, if we think of the universe as like a gigantic information processing system, then the striking thing about it is it's a finite system. You can actually add up the number of bits of information in the universe. It turns out to be 10 to the power 122. It's not a hard calculation, and there's not really any doubt about that number. So it's a huge number. For most practical purposes, it makes no difference. There's plenty of information there to go around, so to speak. Um, the, the number, by the way, is enshrined in something uh, that physicists call the holographic principle, which relates to uh, Jacob Bekenstein and Stephen Hawking's concept of uh, the event horizon area of a black hole being a measure of its, its entropy, which is related to its information content. I, I won't dwell on the technicalities. Um, but there is a sort of deep reason where, why this uh, 120, 10 to the 122 comes from. Uh, so. Express informally, then, uh, the laws of software imply that there will be a sort of inherent fuzziness or wiggle room in the operation of the physical laws, uh, simply because uh, they don't have infinite fidelity. You see, so long as Mother Nature can compute in this transcendent platonic realm of perfect mathematical forms, she can do so to infinite precision. That's what Newton assumed, infinitely precise clockwork mechanism. But if it's really a finite uh, state system, uh, then that's a fiction. We simply cannot invoke calculative routines in describing the world uh, that uh, exhaust its computational resources. What does it mean to say uh, that we uh, have a state of the world which cannot be even specified without more bits of information than can be contained even in principle in the entire observable universe? Are there such states? Uh, well, there are indeed. Uh, and I'll give you an example because it's a curious one. Um, in quantum mechanics, uh, particles can be entangled together. It's a technical term. I won't go into what it is, except you'll probably have heard uh, Einstein's famous phrase, ghostly action at a distance. And it means that particles are, uh, can be spatially separated, but linked in some way. Uh, and um, the great hope of the quantum computing industry, which would represent an exponential leap over the conventional computing industry, uh, is to entangle together a large number of particles, electrons, atoms, or whatever, uh, to use the thing to compute. It turns out that an entangled state of just 400 particles already hits this 10 to the 122 limit. Uh, in other words, it's impossible to even specify, let alone predict the behavior of a state of more than 400 entangled particles. Now, uh, for, for most people steeped in the platonic tradition, they say, so what? You know, Mother Nature will be able to compute what these things do. But if you really think that the laws of physics are inherent in the universe, this limit of 400 entangled particles represents a problem. And I'm going to stick my neck out and say that I will predict that if we create such a state, 
that what physicists would call the unitary evolution of this state would break down. Something funny would happen. Now, seeing as that the industry has set its sights on 10,000 entangled particles, it could be of practical significance. And it's something that may be tested in the near future. So it could actually matter as to whether the laws are infinitely precise platonic things or whether they're, as it were, in the universe. And I'm, I'm getting very near to the end now, in case you're getting a bit bored with this. Um, the other circumstance in which uh, it might matter is uh, in the very early universe. When the universe was smaller, it could contain less information, and the fuzziness of these laws would have been correspondingly greater. So according to this view, the, the universe and its laws could have co-emerged with the laws sharpening over time onto what we see now from a sort of fuzzy beginning. And again, John Wheeler was there years and years ago. He said everything comes out of higgledy-piggledy. There are no laws, uh, except the law that there is no law, and it's an emergent quality. So I've drawn uh, very much upon his work, upon uh, the work of Paul Benioff. I've mentioned Seth Lloyd, Andre Lindy, David Deutsch, and Rolf Landau have all contributed to this view, uh, which I've we woven together in my own personal manner, but components of it are, uh, can be found uh, among the work of other physicists. So uh, lastly, well, how, can, uh, how th does this matter? How can we use this to explain the Goldilocks enigma, the existence of observers and uh, uh, beings like ourselves? Uh, and and di deep questions like, why are we here and why is the universe biofriendly? Is there a connection? Is the fact that the laws are, as you were, malleable and fuzzy in the past, can that be somehow used to explain the biofriendliness of the universe that emerged? Well, I think it can, uh, but I'm not sure how much time uh, I've got. I just, uh, what I should probably do is to just uh, uh, say in a few words what I have in mind here, and then if it, uh, there is time or in question time, I can show one or two slides to make it clearer. Um, but I, um, uh, I want to uh, motivate it by just appealing to some work that Stephen Hawking published uh, last year. Uh, when you apply quantum mechanics to the universe as a whole, which is what we're doing here, um, and the standard way of doing it, you dream up some sort of wave function for the universe or quantum state for the universe, uh, which would have been the state at the beginning, at the Big Bang, and then you evolve it forward in time using mathematics, and then you draw consequences of what branches of the wave function are here and, and there and so on. But Hawking points out that, of course, that's not the way we do science, not the way human beings enter into the equation. Human beings observe the universe here and now, and we infer the past from present observations. Now, quantum mechanics is perfectly time symmetric. Uh, now, any of you thinking Stuart Hameroff at this stage, stop. This, is <laughs> <laughs> this, this stuff is OK. Um, so the laws of physics are, perfect, are perfectly symmetric in time. Um, and uh, so when we, inf uh, when we retrodict the past, just when we predict the future in quantum mechanics, there's a fuzziness and uncertainty. And the technical way of saying that is that the present state of the universe uh, is an amalgam or a superposition of different branches, evolutionary branches of the wave function, all leading to this, uh, all together leading up to this point. And so the act of observation is an act of selection or pruning of this uh, different sort of multiverse uh, of, of different uh, branches. And so Hawking points out that, that there is a sort of backwards in time effect, but it's not a backwards in time causation. It's not that what happens now changes what happens in the past. It's just that what happens in the past has an inherent quantum fuzziness or indeterminism by the very nature of quantum mechanics. And that observations made now resolve, in part, that ambiguity in the past. Now, that, this is not in doubt. And I could show some experiments that have been done to confirm it on, on a small scale. Um, this aspect of quantum mechanics, weird though it is, is not in doubt. It's a sort of non-locality, which is across space, but also across time. So it's not a, a question of sending information or physical effects back into the past, but it's, effect, it's uh, an effect of uh, acknowledging that the past is not completely and totally defined until we make observations and resolve that uh, ambiguity. And all I'm suggesting, that's the, that's the part that isn't radical. It sounds radical, but that, I think, is accepted by most physicists. The part that's radical is to say, what if we extend that ambiguity resolution from the state of the universe, that is, the states of all the particles and fields and so on, where it's accepted that that is uh, uh, part of normal quantum mechanics, what if we extend that to the laws that underpin them? So instead of taking fixed platonic laws and fuzzy states that can be resolved through observations, supposing the laws themselves are fuzzy for the reasons I've outlined here, then we see 
how observers connect to the laws in this deeper quasi-mechanistic manner. Now, this is a, a, what John Wheeler would call not an idea so much as an idea for an idea. It's the outline of a research program, but it's one that I think could provide this linkage between space, time, laws, life, and observers without appealing to anything outside the universe as God-given or imposed upon it from the outside. So uh, that's all I have to say. I think it's progress of a sort, but it's work in progress. Thank you.